welcome everybody in the real world and in the virtual world. Uh, we are having our fireside talk. The fire is also virtual. Uh, this is an event uh, done by the by EPOS, the CRC Research Center between Mannheim and Bonn, as well as the Mannheim Center for Competition and Innovation, Maki. And we are very happy to have Jan as our guest, and we will talk about his exciting book, where I hope uh, this will come across, and uh, the excitement may be, um, yeah, you may be on, on positively excited or negatively excited, we will see, uh, because it's a paradox. So let's start with the profit paradox. Before uh, we enter the conversation, just a very few words on uh, Jan. Jan Eckhout is professor at uh, UPF uh, Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. He, uh, before that, he was a professor, tenured professor at University of Pennsylvania and at University College of London. Among many distinctions, he is fellow of the Econometric Society and of the European Economic Association. Jan claims to be a macroeconomist uh, with a particular interest in labor, but he has very broad interests and some of that I can even associate as a microeconomist. And the profit paradox, I guess, is something about uh, which interests traditionally a lot of microeconomists. And as uh, Jan, among many things, argues in his book, The Profit Paradox, well, it's also something macroeconomists and in particular labor economists should be interested in. So what is the profit paradox? So basically, let me just try and, and introduce the, the profit paradox. One of the things about writing a book like that, and many of you are you know, regular academics, so this is a book at aimed somewhat at academics, but also at the broader audience. And so I you know, try and explain some of these concepts and ideas in, a, in, a, in an accessible way. So for example, I never use any terminology that we use all the time. So let me introduce the profit paradox in that way. I'm gonna do it with an example. And the example is a true example. The only thing that's not true is the name of the persons involved. Uh, what's the example that just before the pandemic, I meet a friend, I meet this friend um, in a bar in the US, I was there for a conference and we hadn't seen each other for a long time. And so, you know, we greet each other, nice to see you. And then we start talking a little bit deeper and I ask my friend Alex, not his true name, um, how are things? And he says, well, things are not good. I've, after 15 years in Silicon Valley, I've decided to uh, move out. I'm, uh, I've not been successful with my startup, actually several startups, he had failed a few before. And he says, I'm returning back to Europe. He's a European, um, that's it, I've tried and I, I failed. And as we are talking in American bar, the TV screens are on 24 hours a day. And there just happens to be a, an announcement of the Dow Jones reaching at that point 25,000. I know it's falling, so it might get back to 25,000, but we, we've been at 36, nearly 37,000. And so it was 25,000 and the, the news report by the journalist bringing the news, the anchor was, this is great news for the economy. This is wonderful because, you know, if the stock market is doing well, that means that the economy is doing well. And as we're talking, Alex is not for me. I mean, I, I, I don't have that experience. For me, this, you know, exuberant stock market, I didn't see it. In fact, I didn't see it with my friends, colleagues, competitors who had startups. It was a very different experience. And as we were going on and talking, there's the waitress who brings us the drinks. And she says, well, she's overhearing the conversation. It wasn't very busy. She says, I've been doing this job at this bar. Okay, since I think she said 93, so in, it was in uh, uh, 19, it was over 15 years, I actually get exactly the same wage since back then. Okay, I haven't seen my wage going up. And she says, I actually agree with the observation that this great news about the stock market is not so good news for me personally. And that is a little bit what you know the profit paradox is about, that you know, on the one hand, you see these exuberant profits, which must say something good about this uh, 
sector in the economy that's doing extremely well. And on the other hand, you see a lot of people who don't feel it that way. And I hope the conversation today is about really what is it exactly? Why is it? And what are really the things, you know, is this just an experience of Alex and the waitress or is this something uh, more broadly? That's my profit paradox. So the profit paradox uh, then says that what may look rosy, which is that the stock market is performing well, um, that may not be necessarily good news for people. And I guess you talk mostly about the workers or people who are employed somewhere. And uh, so what's the story behind? So basically, let, let's start with, with a few facts. Um, let me start with, with the fact of when you say the people, it's also entrepreneurs and people, you know, uh, who have startups like Alex. One of the facts we see, and by the way, I'm going to cite quite a few facts about the US. We'll come back to the facts about uh, Europe uh, uh, later on. But one of the big facts that we've seen since the 1980s is that the fraction of startups, so it used to be around 14% of every firm in the United States was a new startup firm. That basically means a firm that's less than one year old. That was in 1980. Today, it's less than 8%. So it's nearly half of what it was before. Now, if you want to be funny, I've tried it at a cocktail party or at a beer and you say this after people had a couple of drinks, you say this, you know, there's fewer startups today than there were 40 years ago. People are going to say, you're crazy. You know nothing. And you can cut the data which way you want. You can look at it different ways. You can look at what the definition of a startup is. You can look at only Silicon Valley, by the way. It's even true there. The point is we see fewer young firms. That's really the broad fact. And if you see fewer young firms, that basically means what we know from the data is that young firms are firms that typically innovate more, that they grow faster, and that they hire more people. Because if you grow, you need to hire people. And they typically hire younger workers, by the way. Okay, so these are a number of stylized facts about what these young, innovating, growing firms are doing. And if you think about it, we see quite a few less of those now, about half than what we saw 40 years ago. So the point being, this is kind of the first implication. <clears throat> I'll talk about the labor market broadly defined, but it's, it's not just something about the labor market, it's something economy-wide. And, and before we go to the next fact, I should say that, you know, and I've talked as a result of, of the, the book to, for example, employer organizations. I'm Belgian, I went to Belgium, I talked to the two big employer organizations. One is really for the small and medium enterprises, the other one is for everyone. The one from the, everyone said, there's no problem, your facts are wrong, there's nothing. The one from the small one says, we really want to know because all our, our members are really worried about AWS, the cloud service of Amazon, they're worried about you know, these big firms squeezing us, they're worried about the pricing of these uh, dominant firms for, to whom we supply or whose uh, uh, clients we are. And so when I talk about the consequences, I started on purpose with the startups because it's really something that's economy-wide also within the world of business. And we see it in facts because, you know, let me come to what is the profit paradox. Well, profits have gone up. Average profits have gone up. Profits were about 2% of GDP in the 80s. It's about 14% today, okay? But that doesn't tell the whole story because this 14% of profits is really going to a very small fraction of the firms, okay? So you're all familiar with the firm size distribution. The firm size distribution has shifted to the right and it's all in the tail. That's on size but also on profit. So we see that this profit distribution has basically kind of have had its tail go out. If you plot a 90th percentile, that goes through the roof. Okay. But what that means is that if you look at the typical firm, let's call it the median firm, their profits have either been the same or declined and everyone below the median, their profits have declined. So at least half of the firm population is doing worse. True average profits have gone up, but it's going to a small fraction uh, of the firms. And I think that's 
already telling us something about this paradox that there is clearly good news and it's already hinting at the mechanism to which we're going to come later on but it's something really very much about you know which firms get that you know profit and, and which firms don't yeah, I guess we haven't got yet there because one story could be actually that's good news. It could be that in the past it was not a very innovative uh, environment and many firms kind of uh, could make their living and what we're seeing are times of great innovation and the innovators, they are the ones which are uh, running ahead and the others who are not innovating, they are left behind. So that would be kind of a positive innovation story. Perhaps you have some other facts which could go against that yes. story. I mean, yes, because the, the I like the description that you make about the innovators, the ones who run ahead. And in a sense, that's a very Schumpeterian view of the world. We need, in order to grow, we need innovation. And we know that you can't really grow. We've seen the Soviet Union. It doesn't really work very well if you have centralized innovation. So, And it's very hard to do. We see that even today, most of the innovation comes from small firms. You know, BioNTech was a very small firm when they invented or produced, because they had invented it a long time ago, in fact, but just when they came up with the vaccine. And it's not that large firms don't innovate. It's just that they innovate different and they probably innovated in the past. I mean, Google innovated heavily in the 90s. That's why they became so big. The question is, what are they doing now? But before, as you said, we come to that mechanism about, you know, what these large firms do and how they run ahead of the other ones. Let me come back to some of the other consequences. The, you know, one of the big implications is, is our waitress, the story of our waitress. And the first thing you say, by the way, this is not true in Germany. I would be a little bit uh, cautious because it's also true in, in, in most of Europe. But the fact in the United States is if you look at productivity, so you plot basically over time what happened to productivity and productivity has been growing at a fairly steady rate. There's a bit of debate about what happened in the last uh, 15 years, that there may have been a productivity slowdown. But over you know 1945, the end of the Second World War until now, we've seen a fairly steady uh, growth of productivity. Now plot against that wages, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm not gonna take all wages. I'm gonna take the wages of 90% of the working population. These are all the ones who have no managerial or supervisory job. Okay, so take people who do production and services. And then you see that plot of that wage, sorry, that productivity, and you put next to it the wage, you normalize it so they start at the same point. It's actually going in lockstep until the year 1980. And then what happens to wages? It's flat. So since 1980, real wages, of course, adjusted for inflation, have not changed. These 90% of the wages, of course, we know that there are people who get paid enormous amounts. And many of you are here to hope to be one of those who are in the top 10%, because you know, there's a huge return to education. And we know that much of the wage inequality is actually coming from the top percentiles, the top 10 percentile. And if you actually dig a little bit deeper, Piketty and Sais will say it's actually the top 1% that's responsible for nearly all the increase in inequality. And so we see that, and that's this wage stagnation. Now, you think, okay, we have a story for wage stagnation, which is skill bias technological change. We know that if you become more productive, and that's technological, and we're going to talk about technology, technology quite a bit more, that you see that there's this you know, increase in the productivity of some jobs and not in the others. But it's a little bit worrisome that the productivity, when I say there's wage stagnation, there's of course also heterogeneity within that, the productivity or the wages rather of those who have a level of education that's up to high school, up to the age of 18, their wages have gone down, their real wages. So in the United States, since 1980 until now, you earn 15% less if you have high school or less, okay? Now, if you really believe, and we touching on one of the reasons, the competitive model of the labor market, that means that you get paid your marginal product. So that says, if you're low skilled, as in high school or less, your marginal product has gone down by 15%. Now that's hard to believe. Why is it hard to believe? Because you know, it's true that there's skill bias technological change. And if you do 
coding your productivity is going to have much more than if you're just a security guard outside a building. But even the productivity of security guards, of drivers has gone up because we have GPS technology to monitor. We have, you know, now time and, and location can be monitored much better. So you can make these jobs more productive. So the last thing I would think is that their productivity has gone down. It may have grown little or nothing, but down, that's really surprising. And this already gives us a hint that, you know, there is a wedge between the productivity and the wage that they're getting. And that wedge has to do with this profit paradox. But I guess we want to go to maybe some more facts first. If Perhaps we can try to get this profit paradox and get in why perhaps from the individual level, it's kind of difficult to understand why these, why there are lower wages, if we think about just about uh, marginal productivity but uh, that there may be some kind of rebalancing going on. And I think that has something to do uh, with market power. And uh, since the profit paradox very much relies on market power, perhaps uh, we start with the facts on market power. Okay. So, so basically the, 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 the facts on market power already hinted at, you know, these, this profitability going up. They, I think there's many different ways to measure market power and most of you are familiar with it. Let me start by one, which is the, the markup, the price at which you sell something relative to the marginal cost. So basically the, the, the per unit production cost, the last unit production cost. Uh, second one is profit rates. I like to also look at concentration ratios, although we have big problems in doing this properly and, and especially doing analysis with it is, is problematic. I like to look at valuations of firms, if it's publicly traded firms, stock market valuations, especially as a ratio to sales. Why? Because ultimately the stock market value is the discounted stream of future profits. And so that tells us something about what's going on with these firms. In fact, these measures tell us the same story. What are the facts until the 80s? Profits, markups, stock market valuations as a share of sales were flat. From 1980 onwards, we see this rise. There's a spectacular graph of the Dow Jones. The Dow Jones in real terms, because of course, if you go down any finance website, they don't adjust for inflation, you see the Dow Jones going up. But if you adjust for inflation, and in particular, you think about the high inflation we had in the 70s, you see that anyone who invested a dollar in 1945 in the Dow Jones had exactly a dollar in 1981, okay? And then the growth rate in real terms of the Dow Jones has been 7% on average per year, in real terms. So basically there's a, there's a huge difference between what was happening before 1980 and, 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 and after 1980. And when we look at, again, these distributions, there's a huge difference between who that is. To start with the Dow Jones is 30 firms. These are not random firms. You know, you get into the Dow Jones because you're big. You get into the Dow Jones because you have market power. Look at the list, okay? We can look at their measures of market power. They're all at the top of this distribution. You can broaden your index and go to the S&P 500, 500 firms. But even there, we still have nearly all of these dominant firms. And what we see, if you look at the entire distribution, we see again this spreading out or this, this stretching of that distribution. A few firms in the entire distribution in the United States, there's about 6 million firms. If you talk about 500 firms, that's a small number of firms. Even if we would look at, you know, thousands of firms, these publicly traded, it's still a, a, a small selection. But even within the publicly traded firms, we see that some of these firms suffer. We see very small firms also within publicly traded firms. Okay, it's not the case that all of this is Amazon and Apple. There's quite a few different uh, firms. So the first thing is on the facts of this market power, what has happened is that it's become, you know, a few dominant firms who's extremely profitable. Most of them haven't done much better. And it's true in all sectors. Our first guess or our first kind of uh, intuitive re reaction was, Oh, this is, when I say our, this is, by the way, a joint work with uh, Jan de Looker and then several other co-authors on different uh, papers. When, when we first saw this, we, we, we thought this is just the tech sector. Okay, so you have the, the big five, you have, you have, you know, 
kind of, you know, we think of Amazon, Apple, Google, uh, Facebook. And of course it happens there, but it's much broader than that. One of the things that other people have picked up on is that even if it's true in textiles, you know, Inditex in Spain is traditional sector, but the, 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 industry, the, the industry, the textile industry is a traditional sector, but they use technology very heavily and they use kind of these same scale effects that we see that an Amazon or that a Facebook uh, uses. And they use very similar ways to scale their business because of that. By making huge investments, as you already mentioned, Martin, that you know the firms that do well, they're really, really heavily investing and they're enormously innovating and enormously productive. But that's part of the problem because part of the problem is that if you get scale economies, okay, this enormous productivity means that there's really no room for a second player. Alibaba, for example, has been trying to get into the US market for retail to compete against Amazon and they're really not very successful. But Walmart is competing against Amazon. So there is some elements of competition are probably there. And I guess that's not the point to discuss that there's no competition. No, no. Uh, the question is whether there's sufficient competition. And so we have now, I guess, a number of uh, what we may call facts. And let's see how, whether I get them right. So one is that we are seeing actually less of startup activity, which may suggest that at least for some type of innovation, the innovation by the small firms, there's possibly less going on. I guess we may want to look closer at different sectors to see how globally relevant and how globally correct that is. But th th so that's the first fact. The second fact you mentioned is, uh, at least in the US, real wage stagnation. So that means it's really about real wages. The question is, are we counting them correctly? I guess the smartphones in the 1980s weren't that great because they didn't exist. So, so in terms of, it's always still the question of what do I get for my money? And if we look at, at a time where quite a number of, and it's not just a smartphone, even if you think about uh, traditional household, apl household appliances, and there has been technological progress. And the question is, are we correctly pricing them in? So when we talk about constant real wages, we still have to understand to what extent uh, we are really comparing uh, the same bundle. So that's uh, the second observation. And then, as you mentioned, by a, a large, a broad number of indicators of market power have gone up over the last decades. And I guess the important thing is, well, there are many things happening in this world. Are they connected? And I guess the claim in the book is at least those developments are connected. And before we get to understand how they could be connected, are there other facts we need to know to get there? I mean, there's maybe there's a few other facts, but there's one possibly big one, which is also another one that you probably better don't try out at a cocktail party when someone has drunk, is that the duration of employment has become longer. Okay, if you ask most people, you would say, well, jobs have become much more precarious, much more risky. That's not, that's not the case. We don't see that. Um, this is something that people call business dynamism. So the rate at which firms turn over their uh, jobs. So the business dynamism has fallen fairly dramatically. Um, basically, you, you could say is this good, is this bad? Maybe we have more secure jobs. One of the, the issues that, that is at stake here is that there's much less kind of uh, through flow of, of people from the bottom of the distribution to the top. So there's less kind of mobility, social mobility in, in through, through the, the, the jobs, because if there's less dynamism, there's less changing of jobs. It's not just that you lose or get a job, it's also less, less promotions. And um, you know, one of the, that fact being that, that it's, it's uh, worrisome for most people that this is something that's also kind of related to the, the, the dominance of, of these firms. Um, so maybe let me start with that fact to try and think a little bit about uh, what, what the, the mechanism is. So the way I see the mechanism is very much related to what you said, Martin, is, is firms heavily invest, are extremely productive, and they build 
a position of dominance, which is the objective of a firm that invests. I mean, that's that's why you do it in, 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 in the first place. Now, I like to kind of, since this is a book telling stories, I like to tell the story. It's, by the way, not in the book because I came up with it afterwards. That's one of the things about writing a book. You get the best stories afterwards. Um, where you, it's for you to decide whether it's best or not. But, but in a way, if I think about innovation and I think that the digital age, why 1980, is when really we think about the introduction of digital technology that becomes relevant. Most of you weren't born, but what we saw is what we did until 1980s, we never touched the computer. And then in the 1980s, most of us, you know, who are old, we got a computer. We did at school, the people who had a job, you know, they started working with a computer. This was, this was the moment it happened. And it was amazing how sudden and how everyone got it. There was penetration of, of, of technology that was very fast. And it was, it was surprising because it happened in the early 80s and it, it was something that transformed how business was done. Now, of course, this is not something that is nice and smooth because computers became the web in the 90s and then in the 2000s it was mobile phones and then in the 2010s it was probably data and maybe now it's artificial intelligence and there's different aspects and I'm, I'm probably not doing justice by cutting this up in, in, in decades but there's different aspects of happening. Now digital technology or technological change in general is basically a you know is, is the only way in which we can have progress, economic progress in society. And you mentioned, you know, how do we measure the value of information? How do we measure the value that I came from the station? I didn't know where this building was, but my phone told me where it was and I just had to follow the dots. So this is extremely valuable. Before I probably would have had to call Martin and say, I'm at the station, how do I walk here? You know, I didn't print out the map or something like that. And so it, it's it's extremely valuable. So so. Technological change is, is, you know, both the hero of the movie of the economy, but it's also the villain. Why is it the villain? It's the villain because this technology gives you enormous scale advantages. And it's not hard to see that, you know, we have one dominant firm or two dominant firms in the case of Walmart and Amazon, where, you know, a competitive market probably demands a little bit more competition than that. And so you can see what this firm is doing. This firm says, I'm going to invest like crazy or I'm going to reduce costs like crazy, which is the same thing. By the way, what is a markup? What you have in terms of sales relative to your cost. And if either you invest more to sell more or ch cheaper, okay, you invest more to sell cheaper or to have at lower cost. And so that's the objective of the firm. And that's also the good thing. That's the good thing about Schumpeterian growth that is you invest this creates you know progress and then some other firms come in either because they can copy your technology if it's patented when the patent's running out but otherwise they just learn what this technology uh, 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 can do and then they catch up and the profits that you have as a firm from being the leader for a while just disappear like snow in the sun because well because you can get into this market and, and, and I as a competitor see that you make high profits, I enter into this market. But what happens now is if there's enormous scale economies, no one can get into this market. So this Schumpeterian mechanism is failing. It's failing because, well, there are returns to scale or there are maybe other things like network effects or platforms, uh, uh, all the stuff that uh, um, Martin talks about in, in, in his book. So now the thing is, if you have these scale economies, that's precisely where you can use the technology not just to make progress, but you can also use this technology to keep competitors out. And what's the advantage of that? The advantage of that is all this progress, all this value that you create, you don't have to sell it at a price that's close to what it costs you. You can sell it at a price that's higher because you have no one entering. I mean, in a platform, if I look at eBay, why can eBay charge 10% for each transaction? It doesn't cost them 10%. They make enormous profits. The reason why is because a platform has network externalities, so it's better the larger it is. So the larger the pool of users, buyers, and sellers is, the more valuable it is. Because if I have something for sale, I want there to be a lot of buyers. 
And if you have something uh, to buy, you want to have the option of from choosing from different sellers. Now eBay exploits this and says, you know, I can charge you 10%. Why doesn't anyone go to a competitor? Yahoo Auctions tried for a long time. They've never managed to get any reasonable share of the market. And they even offered a commission instead of 10% of half a percent and still no one goes. Why would I go? Because there's no one there. And so that's basically the network externality. We created this beautiful technology, which is enormously valuable. But that technology, because of the returns to scale, doesn't have competition. And so you as a firm can charge prices that are much higher than what the cost is, because that technology at the same time that creates a progress also allows you to keep the competitors out. I guess so. Once we talk about uh, these innovative businesses, some of them actually simply just have very little cost at the, at the last unit. So then just by definition, you will get very high uh, markups. And uh, so therefore, I guess, as you were saying, we look at uh, a number of indicators and high profitability. Is there an important issue? Probably we don't want to look at eBay, which actually kind of uh, is, is not on the, uh, on the winner's uh, side, but there have been others and uh, we know about them. And I guess the important part is, and that's what you also mentioned, it's not just in the technology sector, but it's happening in a large number of sectors. So one element which we would like to have perhaps as a fact is not just that these profits are high, but also that they are persistent so that you that the winner of yesterday is also likely to be the winner of uh, tomorrow. And uh, suppose that we have all those facts now with us and now we move to the labor market. So why does that help us better understand of why our, uh, the waitress or the waiter in this bar are not seeing higher real wages. So the mechanism is the following. So if you charge a price that's higher than what your cost is, that means that the, there are going to be customers who are not buying in the end. There's going to be the customer who says, well, it's a little bit too expensive for me. I'm not buying. If it was a price that was more competitive, there would be more customers buying it. So if you have more customers that are dropping out and saying at this higher price, I'm not buying it, that means that you produce fewer units. And so if you produce fewer units, that means that you need less labor to produce stuff because ultimately everything is going to be produced by somehow labor. You might say, why is that true for Google or why is that true for Facebook? But, you know, they have call centers, they have uh, app developers who are a function of how many users you have. And so there's a lot of kind of a, a derivative job that exists for which there's basically demand as a function of uh, the number of users. And so what these higher prices do is they lower the demand for labor and the lower labor demand leads basically to lower wages. Now, it's very important that this is not something that is directly attributable to one firm. So if I'm saying there's however large Google is, it's not the fact that Google has this effect on its own workers or on the labor market as in general. It's because we've seen this happen in the economy as a whole. And it's these four or five or 600 firms that are large and dominant that have been able to basically, all of them jointly charge prices that are higher. And now we're talking about not just one firm even if it's a big one, it's a small share of GDP. If you have these 500 firms or these 1,000 firms, now we have a share of GDP that's sizable. And now it starts to show up in this demand for labor to produce, and now it starts to show up in the wages. And the quantitative modeling of this shows that these effects are large. In fact, there's a distinction between what, you know, dominant firms have directly as an effect on their workers and what they have through this indirect effect that I just explained. The direct effect is what we call monopsony and is basically the fact that think of a copper mine in the mountains and you know because the workers are stuck there they can only work for the copper mine wages are going to be lower than what their productivity is and so basically the dominant firm can actually directly, directly pay its workers lower wages but as I said this is not the issue for Google. It's not that Google pays its workers less. And so this indirect effect is something much more 
kind of macroeconomic, and that's why Marta was saying I'm a macroeconomist. So, you know, this is basically a channel that's going much more indirectly. And when we quantify these both, both these channels, the monopsony channel and then this in the direct monopsony channel and the indirect monopsony channel to try and understand where is this wage stagnation coming from, what we see is that the direct channel, the monopsony channel, is about 20% of this wage stagnation. And the reason why is we don't measure much of an increase in monopsony power. It's there, but it's not changing much. Okay. May I ask on this direct channel? So I think it's in a way comforting to see that it's perhaps not that large. And so it's really the, what you call the, the macro or the equi equilibrium perspective, which is the key part, because I guess the direct effect in general is not very clear in which direction it goes. And what we have also seen as a development over the last decades it's, uh, is a reduction in unionization, also sectoral shift away from sectors where unions traditionally were strong and they're not strong. So in, in the sense, what that means is that here an increase in market concentration may actually lead to a direct effect of the opposite sign of what you're mentioning. And uh, at least in Europe, I guess there are a number of examples where we see that uh, workers uh, staying with a large firm being with a strong union, that they actually better get a better deal than the small competitors outside, which means that they are actually benefiting from the market power of that firm. Right. And therefore any uh, result of wage stagnation would need to come then entirely or even more than entirely from this indirect effect. Exactly, I mean, that's exactly what we find that, that, that you know, this, this, the monopsony effect is there and if, you know, but it, it, there's not much of, much of a change. I think it's more, also more interesting to see, I didn't anticipate that the indirect effect could be so large, frankly, because I, you know, it, it's very hard to imagine how this is working because it's going through basically something that you don't directly observe. And the way we measure this quantitatively is we basically, you know, you have to use aggregate outcomes to, 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 to try and, and, and quantify this. But it's also true that this 14% of profits that we see that the aggregate economy is now absorbing, this has to go somewhere. Right, because ultimately you have a pie that you divide and whether you look at the firm level or at the economy wide level, the division of the pie of what we call value added or GDP, okay, value added at firm level GDP at the economy wide level is basically two thirds is going to workers to wages, one third is going to capital and then what's left over is profits. And in 1980s, as I said, that was 2% profits and this has become 14% of profits. And that's going at the cost of, of course, that share that's going to works in that share that's going to capital. By the way, the capital share, as you call it, has also decreased slightly. So basically, firms are also investing less for the same reason, by the way. Why do you invest less? Again, because you sell at higher prices. So you basically need less machines to produce it. Machines can be intangibles, of course. They can be software or whatever it is. Um, Okay, so let's, let's then perhaps split this up a little bit more. So there's capital and labor. And I think from what you said at the beginning, uh, the answer, the broad answer will be clear, but let's see a bit more detail. So who is actually then the winner, if there are any winners on the labor side? So you mentioned the lower 90%, uh, there's actually stagnation for the whole 90%. Can you say it a bit more? Are there also uh, uh, people where you would say, well, the real wage actually dropped and who of the, the workers are actually the, the winners, if there are any? I mean, the, I would say roughly 10% are winners and substantial winners. If you again look at the wage distribution, that a bit like the profit distribution, the, the upper tail is really moving out. Who are they? They're basically in terms of description of jobs, you know, we have occupational classifications, which are managers and supervisors, which are professionals, you know, I guess we're all in that category. Um, and so, and add to that, I'm gonna call this superstar workers in the sense of people who have a particular skill that's very scarce. So if you, and this is a little bit the contradiction, if you manage to get into Google, that means that you're gonna 
be treated like royalty because you get your food for free or if you have a baby they have a daycare you they do your laundry they pay you an enormous salary because you're one of these superstar workers you have a coding skill that not many people have and there's enormous demand for that and so that's no more than 10 percent of the working population it's of course not all kind of it's not all soccer players and 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 this but but many of the professionals are in in that that uh, situation when you when you have a scarce uh, skill part of that is also again technology that augments your skill so there, there's this what we call skill bias technological change but there's also something which is that many of these workers and let me give you the example of ceos really the top paid people what we see is that which firms hire the best CEOs? So the, if the best CEO is the one who's most paid and it's Tim Cook from Apple, okay? Now you can ask, why is Tim Cook at Apple? Well, he started at Apple, good. But why is he the CEO of Apple? Why doesn't he get poached away by Google, for example? You know, if he's so good at it, why don't they try and get him away? They probably have tried. Now what we see, and now I'm gonna go away from Tim Cook because it's not just about these tech firms, what we see is that the firms that have most market power are paying their CEOs most. Now, owners of firms are not generous. It's not because they like to pay GEO to CEOs. They do that because they basically get something in return for that. And what do they get in return? They get in return that a good CEO makes your firm more productive and therefore you can exert more market power. Okay, you've all done Cournot here, right? So take a Cournot model with two, um, with two firms. If the two firms are identical, the markup, the market share and the profits are identical. And let me now do a mean preserving spread. I make one of the firms better and the other one is worse. What happens? Well, what happens is that the markup of that better firm is now gonna be larger. The share is gonna be larger than 50% and the profits are gonna be larger than this firm. In fact, you probably don't think of it like that, but you can have basically as if it's monopoly and a duopoly. Why? Because if I make them sufficiently different, this one firm is going to behave like a monopolist because that small firm is just not doing anything. But what the implication of this is that with these two productivities very different from each other is that the markups in this duopoly market are much higher than if they're identical. Because there's this one firm that has 99% of the market behaving like a monopolist. Now, if you, so we look at firms that have market power, and now we have to decide which manager to hire. If I get a better manager, I can increase that productivity more than if I get a worse manager. Who's willing to pay most? The ones who are at the top. Because the firms at the bottom, they really, you know, they don't get so much as the Americans would say, bang for their buck, because you know, if you're at the bottom, you don't make that much in terms of profit. So you can't really pay that much to, to, to a manager. Whereas if you're at the top, you know, the more you can make this manager distinguish and make you more productive compared to your competitors, the bigger that gap is and the bigger the profits are gonna be. Now, since everyone wants these top managers, all the firms that are at the top in their market, there's big competition for that. And that basically increases the demand for these very good managers. What we see is that these top managers, okay, on average, for all the managers, the contribution of this market power is about 45%. For the top managers, it's 80%. So their wage, their salary is determined 80% by the ability to increase the dominant position of a firm. Now, to come back to your question, who are the winners? Well, anyone who can make the productivity relative to competitors, the ability to exert market power higher for their firm. And the firm says, come and code for me because you know you change one line in the Uber app and it's gonna affect millions of users. And it's gonna affect millions of users that allow me basically to extract bigger amounts of rents. And these are the ones who are benefiting most from uh, the situation. So, the, so this mechanism, uh, this story was, was global in a way. And I guess that's also part of the book, the claim that much of what we're talking about is a global phenomenon. Most of the 
the data, or most of the, the writing is kind of focused on the US. Now let's, let's move to Europe. Is there any thing where we should see, well, perhaps the problem is less severe or certain elements are different? Uh, what's your, your take on this if we are, say, in, in Belgium or Germany? Is there anything different? But there's no doubt that many of these dominant firms are based in the United States. It's not true that there's none of these dominant firms also in Europe. So we have, I talked about Inditex, the textiles giant from Spain. We have Booking.com in Holland. I guess you have Bettelsmann here in uh, Germany. You have more here in Germany. Um, we have ABM Bef in, uh, uh, in Belgium who are really in the league of these top uh, firms. So, so may I interrupt there? Just We do have those firms to a certain extent also in Europe. And we do have also firms, I'm not saying they don't exist in the US, but perhaps in terms of relative importance, uh, they are bigger, at least in, in countries uh, such as Germany, which are the so-called hidden champions, uh, which don't figure actually in most of the numbers because many of them are privately owned, uh, who have a very narrow product range. So they don't even figure in terms of overall sales that much but they have very high profit margins and they clearly have dominant positions even in world markets. What I don't know is their dynamics from the 80s until now of whether that has increased or not. Possibly yes, with an increase of globalization. Um, but so we do have those firms, but perhaps they are more difficult to measure. Yes, the ones we can measure, we see the same development whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in, in uh, Australia, so to speak. But it's true that we, it's might, we don't have as good data here, especially on these privately held firms uh, as we have in the United States. But let me say one thing, you know, at least for the data that we have, we see Europe is the same as the US. It's a subset of the firm, so it's not complete. But let me say one thing, let's go to the US. Suppose you live in Alabama. As far as I can tell, there's not one big firm in Alabama. Okay. one of these dominant firms. Most of them are in California. Does that make a difference? Well, even if you're in California, you're in Sacramento. Okay, you're in the same state. All these firms are now in Silicon Valley. You pay more for all these services. Does it matter? Well, these dominant firms, who owns them? Well, it's Zuckerberg, it's Brin, it's Gates. You don't own them. Well, actually, I own some of them because I have a pension fund. I don't choose what's in it, but for sure they will pick in a diversified pension fund. I think I probably own Apple without knowing because it's an index fund. Not fully, though. No, no, I own a very, very tiny bit. So the question is, does it matter where these firms are? And the point I'm trying to make with this is what really matters is where is the customer? And as I said, in Mannheim, I came from the station to here with a Google app. And then I'm basically, let me call a European using that American app, but it doesn't really matter whether it's an American app or it could have been in Hong Kong or you choose where it is. It doesn't matter where it's based. It matters where the customer is. If I take AB InBev, my Belgian brewers, wherever you go now, chances are that you walk into a bar and you have a Belgian beer. Well, it doesn't, I mean, that beer is from everywhere. It matters where the customer is. And typically these brands are global brands. That's part of their success. So even if we were to show that it's not true that the firm's base, their zip code, their postcode is in Europe, do we care? In fact, their postcode changes because of fiscal incentives. They move to Holland because Holland lets them do the double sandwich or whatever they call it, they go to uh, to Ireland or they go to Panama or they go to the Virgin Islands. So really the location is not much of an issue. What matters is where the customer is and where the person from the app developer is who doesn't develop the app because there's not enough users because the price is too high. It matters where the call center is. It matters where basically all the demand for labor that we're talking about is located. And there, most of them are not in Mountain View, California, all these, you know, uh, 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 derivative 
uh, jobs. And I think that's once we recognize that ownership is concentrated no matter what, it's heavily concentrated. Second, the use is fairly global. So it doesn't really matter whether we see this as an American problem or as a European problem, as long as the customer is the one who's uh, um, uh, paying that price or the worker is the one who's basically seeing that decline in the wage or it's the startup. It could be a startup here in Germany or even, you know, a guy from Europe like Alex who goes to Silicon Valley for 15 years and tries and doesn't make it. So but you, you claim that you're also a labor economist and, uh, and now you're talking all it's about profits and market power of <laughs> firms. So in the sense, all these kind of labor market policies, which are actually playing an important part, at least of the debate in Europe, are they in a way meaningless or can they be used uh, as a way to affect the outcome and have they been affecting the outcome? So clearly minimum wage legislation does affect the wage which is paid. Now, in many countries, perhaps minimum wage legislation hasn't been very effective, but at least as a possible way of affecting the outcome, at least in terms of what the wage is paid, uh, minimum wage legislation can play a role as do possibly some other uh, active uh, labor market uh, measures. There isn't, I haven't seen much on this in the book. Uh, so essentially labor markets are there. We're interested in the outcomes, but labor market policies are not really relevant in this context. I mean, many of the labor market policies that you mentioned are aimed at redistributing. The minimum wage is a clear example. They have efficiency implications, but the main objective is to, to do redistribution. So is basically taxation. Taxation in Europe is much more progressive than it is in the United States. So the progressive taxation is another way of uh, redistribution. So, but we are talking about also issues about uh, inequality, which concern us. So in that sense, redistribution measures should be totally. part of the debate. And, and, and I was just going to finish. This is, you know, part of that debate. It's a debate about the equity. And, and you say, how can it be that, you know, if you work for Google, you make half a million dollars. And if you, uh, uh, you know, starting salary, starting salary, exactly. So, and you do a normal job and you make, you know, a 20th of that. Um, so, so then there's good reasons why you want to redistribute. And, and for the same reason that you, you know, taxing profits, if you can, if you can avoid that they relocate to different, uh, uh, more attractive fiscal uh, havens is also a way to redistribute. But as of course we know, taxing profit doesn't solve the problem that's really giving rise to the inequality, the wage stagnation, the decline in these startups. Redistributing, you know. So, so may I ask why? So if I tax a company 100%, the incentives of creating this moat, how you call it, is somewhat less, right? Because if all my profits are taxed away, so in the in the end, it does affect also the incentives. It does affect the incentives, but you know, now we're entering to inside baseball. But really, you know, your 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 incentive, how much to invest, isn't that terribly changed. I mean, it depends on how you model these things and what the elasticity uh, with respect to to this investment is. But the point is you will never get the first best solution with such taxation. It might help, the profits may help. I mean, to give the best kind of indication or, or, or illustration, if it doesn't depend on the investment, just production, even if I, you know, I've, I'm Amazon, I've already invested everything and now the government says, I'm gonna tax 100% of your profits, you're still gonna produce exactly the same price. You're gonna sell it at the same price. It's only through, are you gonna invest more? Probably not. Okay, and that's, I think, what, what, what you're referring to, Martin. But the point is, you get a, a second best solution. But we know that there's other things to do, which is, and this is maybe the more, you know, an orthodox way of looking at it, which is, think about solving the problem. Now we're God and we can solve the problem. Okay, we can solve the problem of 
market power, we can solve the problem of these dominant firms, we can solve the problem of entry that creates uh, uh, competition, so we can really generate a competitive market. What's the unorthodox so, idea so, so here? Perhaps it would be nice for, for our audience to, to understand how in this kind of dynamic environment with innovation, which we want to maintain, uh, what would we call actually a competitive market? I mean, let me broadly say something that's more Schumpeterian than what we see now, where firms, as you have mentioned, make you know, extraordinary profits, but for a very limited time, that's not persistent. I would say that's getting as close as it does, which permits the innovation. It's not that Facebook is innovating or was innovating in the year 2000, because they said, you know, in 2022, I'm going to make billions. I mean, they were not even expecting to get and that they made that innovation at that point. So, so it's all about the, the, uh, the persistence. So if, if that persistence would might be much lower. Okay, so that we take away. So what we want to, in some sense, what is the problem is the persistence of market power. Uh, the fact that we have a number, actually quite a large number of firms, if we look across sectors, who are there, who have I mean, they're not necessarily completely unchallenged, but it has become much more difficult to challenge them. As a result of that, they enjoy um, very high profits. And uh, that leads to all these problems in the economy with uh, both distributional aspects, but also aspects that overall innovation levels could be higher, right? We are, uh, so we actually not trying to go to a world where innovation is stopping, but rather a world where innovation is encouraged uh, to work. And that's a world where everybody with a good idea has a chance to actually make this idea happening. And so what do we have to do? How to get there? How do we get where not necessarily in the very best world, but at least how can we improve from where we are now? And I think now we're entering also, in, that's more the, then the later the last part of the book is to see well what also has happened in the 1980s so we have seen these technological developments and in a way hand in hand and mostly even um, driven by that um, trend towards uh, globalization but it was not a purely technological one there were also political decisions taken which which made that possible um, so we we have we have seen this trend and uh, we also have seen actually a change in the way uh, competition policy principles were enforced or to say that some of them were, that, that enforcement became weaker, partly associated with a change of thinking, um, also associated possibly with more money by those firms with an interest being spent on uh, things not happening uh, against them. So this has also been kind of a parallel development, which was perhaps not the main uh, force to explain what has happened, but it's something which at least in your book, uh, you, uh, you address and say, well, that's actually the kind of uh, the part we should directly work on. So how do you think we should move forward? And I guess well, in that sense, the book has, is now outdated namely that at least in words and intents, there has been very much a change in rhetoric and a change in uh, what is seen as the right way of moving forward. I mean, first of all, you know, it's a very highly dimensional issue and problem. There's many aspects uh, to it. And let me say one thing, <clears throat> there's a number of policies, many different types of uh, 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 policies. But the, um, it, let me talk maybe about one. Uh, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you um, talk about this as, as well extensively. But if you think about things like interoperability, finding ways in which we have regulation, extended regulation that makes some of these platforms, for example, it's good to have a large platform. So we want scale. But at the same time, we would like to have competition on these platforms. And we, if we can foster that kind of entry of operators on a network, for example, 
with regulation, I think sometimes it's hard, but there are examples where it works. If I look at you know, what happens in the, in the mobile phone market where there was this regulation in Europe where if you were the owner of a cell tower network, you had to allow competitors on there at an agreed price or at a price or a rental price set by the, the regulator that creates competition for the customers. The network is kept large. The same thing with the railway network in all technology. You know, have you one railway network, you have competing operators on it that creates basically access to the customer to compete for the customer, but at the same time exploiting the large scale of that uh, operation. But most importantly, I think what we need is a little bit of a change of the mindset in how we deal with market power. Because what this technological change has done is it's, be, it's made market power bigger, but it's made it also much more of a policy issue. We know how and when markets work, but we also know when they don't. And the objective, in my view, is to create more competition. So whenever we can increase the competition, we will have these positive side effects. Now, how do we do it? Well, you know, we can talk about interoperability. We can talk about many different ways in which to do it. But I think that the first thing is to realize that this is one a big problem. And let me just give you a comparison with some other problem that we have, especially today, which is inflation. Arguably the most successful influence that academic economists has, have ever had on policy is to make the central bank independent. Why? Because until the 70s and early 80s, a politician realized I'm up for election in a few months, I'm going to increase the money supply, people are going to have the feeling that everything is good, and of course, six months after the election, there was inflation. Economists said this is not time consistent, Let this, let's take the monetary policy decisions out of the hands of politicians, and let's make the central bank independent. See, in Frankfurt, we cannot decide as any politician how it should be. Okay. This is extremely valuable. Economists calculate that the cost of inflation is about half a percent of GDP. So basically you look at this, and this is the cost of inflation. Now, if you look at how much we spend, the US and the Europe are about similar, we spend about 5 billion, okay, on running, controlling this, uh, uh, this inflation, kind of independent uh, uh, central bank. Let's now look at what we do with trying to create competition in markets or on the other hand, stop that there is concentration, that there's dominance by firms. Well, first of all, when we look, and this is a number we calculate, but there's other people who calculate similar numbers, the estimates for the cost to GDP instead of half a percent is the case of within inflation is between eight and 10% of GDP. So the cost of these dominant firms, this lack of competition is way higher. It's about 20 times higher than what the cost of inflation is. Now look at what we spend on enforcing this. We spend less than half a billion on it. Number of people, okay, in the United States, there's less than 2,000 people working on it. In a central bank, there's 27,000, okay? It's more than 10 times the number of people in order to enforce something that has a value of half a percent of GDP. I mean, it seems to me like a simple cost benefit analysis. And I'm sure that it's easy to say this because you know how we know how hard it is to enforce competition. But I think with resources and we have good people working on it and all of them say the same thing. You know, we have a lot of friends who are in the enforcement who say the same thing. I mean, we have a hundred cases 90 we don't look at, nine we look at and we say we can't win, let's focus on one. But we should have looked at the 100 cases. We should have at least have an attempt uh, to do that. And I think to me that's the main um, objective or the main target that we should really think of this as a much bigger problem. Is it politically easy? No, because as you already hinted at, there's a vicious circle between the firms who have market power they have profits and therefore funds to do lobbying. What kind of lobbying they do? To get regulation that's giving them more market power. And so therefore they have more funds that they can continue to use. Okay, so let's be optimistic and, uh, and try to and think about, well, what, what would happen if we implement that? So is this 
say a, a stronger mandate uh, together with more resources for, for competition authorities broadly defined, including say regulators, consumer protection agencies, and so on. So is that going to make a big difference? So your argument is it, it will do better. Well, so that's hope for it. I guess it also depends a bit on the implementation. So size of an agency is not the only thing. So, but there is hope to improve. Yeah, is there any way of numbers you could put up? I mean, will we get back to the 2% uh, of profit? Is that the, the target in a way? Where the, the, the early 80s, were they the, the, the days we like to have? I mean, in terms of I, I, th this I, outcome, not I, in terms I of I would say things. yes. By the way, in the early 80s, market power was also not zero. There was also some firms that were dominant but they had much there was fewer of them and the amount of dominance that they had was much smaller and i think this we shouldn't be naive and think that you know we get to zero but i do think that we can may, may interrupt just as a small side remark also it depends very much where you come from as you know that uh, until the early 80s in scandinavia and austria cartels were legal uh, so I guess it depends very much on where you come from, on, 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 on what is the kind of economic environment uh, you were looking at at that point. No, and I, I, I agree. And, and, and in a sense, you know, all these things are no longer there, but it's been replaced by something else. Uh, in the early 80s, we didn't have these technological uh, kind of firms. I should say that it's also not the first time we see this, right? If you go back in history around the turn of the last century in 1900, we also had fast technological change. It was really very physical technology. It was railways, it was electricity, it was oil exploration, it was phone and telegraph. And this created also enormously dominant firms at the same time. Why? Because of course we know now electricity as a utility, gas, oil, you know, it's nearly a natural monopoly because you need a network, you need large volumes, you need, and we are happy to regulate utilities. We're happy to say we don't do it well yet. We've seen it in the last few months. It's complicated. We've seen it in Texas last year with the snow at once prices went up 400 times what the normal price was. It's very hard to do, but, it, you know, we live with it and it's much better than if, utilities would have been completely in an unregulated market. And I think it's harder now because, you know, with utilities, it is still tangible. It's, you know, we maybe because of the experience we have since uh, dealing with for over 100 years, but the digital technology is changing fast, is moving fast. So and this is one thing that for, for the future, I'm, I'm really worried about that they get so good and such precise information that they do better than the market. So let's think more about the present and the uh, essentially the, the discussion which has been ongoing and partly implemented. So there have been huge uh, rescue packages for everybody uh, or, or for at least for many, it has been for workers, for firms. Um, as part of the, the COVID pandemic. And we have now also some discussion about how to help firms uh, affected by uh, uh, trade flow disruptions. What you have seen so far, is this more of a wasted chance? Is it making those who have been strong even stronger or does it move the competition landscape in the direction that it enables those firms who impose competitive pressure on the, the dominant ones, is it strengthening them relative to those who are already dominant? I mean, I think that the, 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 um, the uh, pandemic probably made the dominant firms even more dominant because the, my way to think about the pandemic is in a way is also fast technological change because from you know, between March 10th and March 20th, what we started to do was things very differently in a very short window of time. And that meant also firms did that. And the ones who have benefited most from this, I think, are, and we see it in the data actually, are the firms that were dominant already. So it, it has increased their dominance position. 
you talk about the rescue packages, I think that the only downside I see to that, I mean, it was fairly redistributive and, and in a sense, uh, a way to avoid a very deep uh, recession, which I think is positive. The downside is what we're dealing with now is in part the, the, the inflation that it's, it's creating. Um, but overall, I think where we stand now is that this is a train that's going and the train of, of dominant firms of market power keeps going. I think we, we, uh, we seriously have to start to think about how we can stop this train. It's more like an oil tanker. You know, an oil tanker takes 10 nautical miles to, to slow down or even to stop. And this is going to be something like that. Think about the following. You own stocks in the Dow Jones, so you have a diversified portfolio in the S&P 500. Okay. What if the, so you own, say, 10,000 euros in there. That's worth 10,000 today. Suppose that we are very successful and in five years' time, we can get rid of all the market power and we're back to 1981. So we have basically tamed the dominant firms and we've reduced market power. What's going to happen to the stock market? Well, the stock market is going to crash like crazy. Why? Because the stock market reflects profits. If now these profits are gone, that means that my 10,000 in the S&P 500 is going to be worth much less. The transition from the macroeconomic transition, increasing wages, great, increasing startups, great, but you know, there's going to be a bunch of losers. The ones who own and who live of uh, these profits, including my S&P 500 diversified portfolio. Question from the audience. Can this lower labor demand problem be generalized to other factors of production, for example natural resources? Would increasing competition not only lead to higher GDP and labor demand, but also greater exploitation of the environment as well? I, you know, if, if there's one good thing about market power is that production is lower and so therefore also CO2 emissions is, are, are lower. All that said is that, you know, I don't think we can, I see that, and I'm definitely biased, but I see there's two big socioeconomic problems. One is the environment and one is, is dominant firms. They're related, but, you know, we have to do something about the environment in an equally urgent way as there's something that we have to do about uh, the dominant firms. Let me say that, you know, I'm more optimistic if there was be more competition because as we mentioned at the beginning, there's more innovation by smaller firms. So maybe we get more innovation also in terms of cleaner technologies and, and the like. But I think it's a different set of policies that we really have to uh, start. And, and we talked about um, the taxes before. Here, taxes are not just redistributive. I mean, they are can be used and, and as a way of reducing market power if that goes hand in hand with higher taxes for certain activities that of course uh, works well and, uh, and uh, generates revenues which can be used for other purposes. Question from the audience, how can markets best be identified? Having Martin as the specialist on this, uh, I should defer to him. Let me say one thing before I defer to, 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 to Martin. Especially if we look at the economy as a whole and we really want to measure the amount of dominance some firms have economy-wide, we really want to capture the entire economy. It's impossible to define what a market is. It's... It's hard enough to say, you know, is the market of the restaurants here around the station, is it within 100 meters? Is it 500 meters? Is it a, kilo, a kilometer? How far do you go? It's a very complicated notion to define what a market is. And then we're talking about, you know, but you have the lower level, the higher level restaurants. How do you make that distinction? One of the things methodologically, because you asked about Cournot and Bertrand and, and things like that, what we're doing is we don't take a stance on defining the market. And that, of course, is, you know, it's a heroic or kind of a, a cowardly thing to do in the following sense that we don't do it because we can't see it, we can't observe it, we don't see it in the data. And whatever you try to do in large 
markets is actually doing worse because you measured the opposite of what you want to measure. So one of the things we do is we say, let me take within a narrowly defined industry, and I see a thousand firms in my data because we are talking really about macroeconomic data. So we see all the firms that we use, for example, the US census data. One of the things we do is we say, okay, we have a model, it can be Cournot or Bertrand. We don't really know much. I don't know whether there's more price or quantity competition. Intuitively, I would say more price competition. So let's take whatever model you like, Cournot or Bertrand, and I don't know how many firms compete, but what I do know is I'm going to randomly take some firms. They, in reality, don't compete against each other, but I just want to make sure that I get the distribution of markets right. And in order to get that distribution, I can do that first with 50 firms in the market. And then I do it with 20 firms, and then I do it with 10, and then I do it with five. And then once I do this, let me now see whether I better match the distribution of markets that are better match the distribution of firm sizes that I whether I better match the distribution of revenue. And so basically, this is it. I said cowardly crazy thing to do because I'm putting firms together that don't really compete together, but it is the case that what we see in reality somehow is that there are firms, we don't know which firms compete, but they must come from the true distribution of firms. So we do basically we sample them randomly and that's kind of the, the shortcut. May I add to this perhaps um, how we should uh, think about uh, competition possibly going on. So suppose that there is a, a large town and then there is a small island. It takes quite a while to go to this island and uh, so there are two um, I don't know, bars or restaurants or some services uh, around, one in the large city and the other one in the very small island. And so the question is really about skill. And perhaps the one who is working in the small island could as well be working in the, in the large city as well, but it could be that it's, this one has some disadvantage compared to the one dominating or is afraid of just to be beaten up, for example. And uh, if you're afraid to be beaten up, you rather stay on the island. So uh, th this one is competing, not competing in the same market, but it has the necessary skills to compete in the market, but being afraid to be beaten up stays on the, on the island. So in that sense, it may make a lot of sense looking at the broader set of firms where it's just about what are the required skills. And if the skills are available, then in a way they are competitors. They may not be really competing simply because they are afraid of being beaten up or of the other firm using any other anti-competitive means uh, to make such an attempt useless. So there, questions from the audience are allowed with the hope that the mic actually works. Well, uh, there is some empirical evidence of just theoretical uh, that at some point when uh, market power has reached a certain threshold, uh, firms uh, have the incentive to invest rather in uh, anti-competitive measures than in innovation. Is there, do you study, uh, have you found something? like that in your study, because I thought this could be a reason why the 80s uh, are just such an interesting period where films reached a certain area and may influence politics or the market environment. What, what is called killer acquisitions. And so uh, there's evidence that some of these larger firms, they acquire, say, a startup, a smaller firm, with the objective of killing it, because you kill the competitor. And there seems to be quite a bit of, of, of evidence uh, that this is going on. A second example that I think is, is quite instructive is uh, what uh, Amazon did. Amazon. I'm sure you've seen the, whenever there's something about Amazon, they show a, a, a fulfillment center and you see, and so you see these, these robots bringing in these carts, right? And, and it's a little bit different. So they inverted 
the warehousing instead of saying we go with a, a, a is it a forklift and we take something off the of of uh, where it's stored there's a thing that's low on the ground it goes under what, wherever it's stored lifts it up and brings that thing to where it has to be uh, taken off okay and so this is now no one can enter there because this is all kind of completely independent now i think the name of the company that had these little robots that was doing was this kivu i think and Amazon bought those in the early teens, 13, 14, something like that. They said, we like that. We want to do that. They were doing it for them. They said, no, no, we buy you. Okay. I mean, the only reason they said, now we're the owners, where you were working before and the contracts terminate. We don't want anyone else to have this. Of course, this can be copied. And now other companies are copying this. But it took eight or nine years. Kiva would have been an enormous big and successful company but it, they basically managed to delay this type of innovation and i think when we see in the data that small firms innovate more i think in part that's what's going on the large firms have enormous incentives to innovate and they do but they also have enormous incentives to basically increase the moat to keep competitors out and some of that action uh, uh, we see uh, and that can be responsible for for why there's less competition So I think that we are reaching uh, the time limit. Um, we have, well, not really walked, but we have at least touched some of the, the points uh, told in this exciting book, The Profit Paradox by Jan. Um, it's a good read. It's an easy read. It's not a read as part of your work. It's uh, clearly leisure. And uh, so we have uh, time to do so, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, the book is very timely in one way, but possibly outdated in the way how the tone of the debate has shifted, at least uh, in, in some parts in, in the US, but uh, to a lesser extent also in, in Europe. And that can be seen by the appointments uh, at the competition authorities in the US and uh, some of the speeches which are given. So they have uh, reflect a very different uh, spirit. We will have to see what will follow because one of the aspects which has not been covered in this book and uh, which are much harder to change is the way courts make decision. But I think one element which is also mentioned in this book, it's not just some select academics or uh, people working in agencies or ministry, it's possibly the general tone of the debate, which will also affect the way courts uh, will make their decisions. So they are, uh, of course, uh, following partly precedent, but they are also listening uh, to, to the mood uh, which is going on. So in the sense, the big uncertainty of making changes happen is how courts will also react to the extent that actually um, the agencies are following uh, a different line and uh, become uh, and scrutinize certain actions such as mergers and um, firm conduct um, with more resources and uh, with a different possibly with a different view. And uh, just to close, um, I just give a quote from a speech by Jonathan Cantor, who gave that uh, actually yesterday. Um, and so what he says, and he emphasizes the role of choice, the competition in enabling choice. And uh, we may discuss that. So InBev, for example, keeps some of the different labels uh, alive. The question is, well, is that still the same kind of choice that we would get in a market where there is competition? But so what Jonathan Kent emphasizes is competition giving consumers a choice and not just consumers. Without choices, farmers get less competitive bias for their livestock, workers get lower wages, consumers have no choice in who exploits their personal data, protecting competition, and the competitive process is about ensuring people have the power to choose 
between alternatives. That's the quote from Jonathan Cantor, and that's the closing statement of this fireside talk. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Jan for being with us. Thank you.